<clears throat> we have arrived at a unanimous verdict in the challenge to the electoral bond scheme and the amendments introduced to the provision of the income tax, the representation of the People's Act, and the Companies Act, and the RBI. There are two opinions of this court, one authored by myself for Honorable Justice Gawai, Justice Padiwala, and Justice Manoj Mishra, another authored by Justice Honorable Justice Sanjeev Khanna. Both opinions of this court arrive at the same conclusion, though there is a slight variation, a variance in the reasoning which has been adopted. The present batch of petitions raises the following issues. A, whether the non-disclosure of information on voluntary contributions to political parties according to the electoral bond scheme and the amendments to Section 29C of the Representation of People's Act, Section 182.3 of the Companies Act, Section 13, capital A, bracket B of the Income Tax Act are violative of the right to information of citizens guaranteed in Article 19.1A of the Constitution. And B, whether unlimited corporate funding to political parties as envisaged by the amendment to Section 182.1 of the Companies Act violates the principle of free and fair elections in Article 14 of the Constitution. I will now proceed to read out the reasoning and the conclusions. Issue 1. Whether the right to information guaranteed by Article 19.1a includes the information of financial contributions made to political parties, the jurisprudence on the right to information which has emanated from this court can be classified into two phases. In the first phase, the focus of this court was on the close relationship between open governance and information. The judgments in this phase were premised on the principle that the citizens have a duty to hold the government of the day accountable for their actions and inactions, and they can effectively fulfill this duty only if the government is open and not clothed in secrecy. In the second phase, this court recognized the importance of information to form views on social, cultural, and political issues and participate in and contribute to discussions in the polity. A crucial aspect of the expansion of the right to information in the second phase is that the right to information is not restricted to information about state affairs, that is public information. It includes information would be, which would be necessary to further participatory democracy in other forms. The ratio of the judgments of this court in association of democratic reforms and people's union for civil liberties is that the voters have a right to information which is essential for them to cast their votes. The ratio of the judgments is not restricted to information about candidates. Political parties are a relevant political unit in the electoral process. This is evident from the provisions of the 10th schedule of the Constitution, the Election Symbols Reservation and Allotment Order 1986, the Westminster form of government which confers importance to political parties, and the electoral culture in India such as the publication of electoral manifestos by political parties. The information about the funding of political parties is essential for the effective exercise of the choice of voting. One of the factors which contributes to political inequality is the difference in the ability of persons to influence political decisions because of economic inequality. Economic inequality leads to differing levels of political engagement because of the deep association between money and politics. At a primary level, political contributions give a seat at the table to the contributor. That is, it enhances access to legislators. This access also translates into influence over policy making. There is also a legitimate possibility that financial contribution to a political party would lead to quid pro quo arrangements because of the close nexus between money and politics. Quid pro quo arrangements could be in the form of introducing a policy change or granting a license to the person making financial contribution to the political party in power. The electoral bond scheme and the impugned provisions to the extent that they infringe upon the right to information of the voter by anonymizing contributions through electoral bonds are violative of Article 19.1a. We have applied the proportionality standard to determine if the infringement of the right to information is justified. Issue 2. Whether the infringement of the right to information of the voter is justified for the purpose of curbing black money in the electoral process. The right to information under Article 19.1a can only be restricted based on the grounds stipulated in Article 19.2.
The purpose of curbing black money is not traceable to any of the grounds in Article 19.2. We have applied the subsequent prongs of the proportionality standard, even assuming that curbing black money is a legitimate purpose for restricting the right, of in, right to information of voters. Immediately preceding the financial year 2016-17, in which the electoral bond scheme was introduced, 81% of the contributions, rupees 580.52 crores, were received by political parties through voluntary contributions. Since the amount of voluntary contributions is not regulated, it allowed the circulation of black money. However, after the introduction of the electoral bond scheme, 47% of the contributions were received through electoral bonds, which is regulated money. The Union of India submitted that providing anonymity to the contributors incentivizes them to contribute through the banking channels. Assuming for the purpose of hypothesis that the Union of India is right on this prong, what it urges is that non-disclosure of information about political expenditure has a rational nexus with the goal that is curbing black money or unregulated money. However, we are of the opinion that the third prong of the proportionality standard that the least restrictive means test is not satisfied. The electoral bond scheme is not the only means for curbing black money in electoral financing. There are other alternatives which substantially fulfill the purpose and impact the right to information minimally when compared to the impact of electoral bonds on the right to information. On an overall balance of the impact of the alternative means on the right to information and its ability to fulfill the purpose for contributions below 20,000 rupees, Contributions through other, electro other means of electronic transfer is the least respective means. For contributions above 20,000 rupees, contributions through electoral trust is the least restrictive means. Thus, the infringement of the right to information is not proportionately justified for the purpose of curbing black money and electoral financing. Issue 3. Whether the infringement of the right to information of the voter is justified for the purpose of protecting donor privacies. Two issues arise for our consideration. A, whether the fundamental right to informational privacy recognized by this court in Justice K.S. Puttaswamy, nine judges, includes information about a citizen's political affiliation. B, if A above is answered in the affirmative, whether financial contribution to a political party is a facet of political affiliation. The fundamental right to informational privacy recognized in Justice K.S. Puttaswamy, nine judges, includes information about a citizen's political affiliation for the following reasons. A, for forming political beliefs and opinion is the first stage of political expression. The freedom of political expression cannot be exercised freely in the absence of privacy of political affiliation. Information about a person's political belief can be used by the state at a political level to suppress dissent and at a personal level to discriminate by denying employment or subjecting them to trolls. The lack of privacy of political affiliation would also disproportionately affect those whose political views do not match the views of the mainstream. B. In the specific context of exercising electoral franchise, the lack of privacy of political affiliation would be catastrophic. Information about a person's political affiliation can be used to disenfranchise voters through voter surveillance. Voter databases which are developed through surveillance identify voting patterns of the electors and attempt to interfere with their opinions based on the information collected. For example, the data of online purchase histories, such as the books purchased, which would indicate the ideological leaning of the individual, clothing brands used, which would indicate the social class to which the individual belongs, or the news consumed or the newspaper subscribed, which would indicate political leanings or ideologies, can be used to draw on the relative political affiliation of people. This information about the political affiliation of individuals can then be used to influence their votes. C. At a systemic level, information about political affiliation could be used to engage in gerrymandering, the practice by which constituencies are delimited based on the electoral preference of the voters. Financial contributions to political parties are usually made for two reasons. First, they may constitute an expression of support to the political party. And second, the contribution may be based on a quid pro quo. The law as it currently stands permits contributions to political parties by both corporations and individuals. The huge political contributions made by corporations and companies should not be allowed to conceal the reason for financial contributions made by another section of the population, a student, a daily wage worker, an artist, or a teacher. 
when the law permits political contributions and such contributions could be made as an expression of political support, which would indicate the political affiliation of a person, it is the duty of the constitution to protect them. Not all political contributions are made with the intent of attempting to alter public policy. Contributions are also made to political parties which are not substantially represented. Contributions to such political parties are made purely with the intent of expressing support. It is true that contributions made as quid pro quo transactions are not an expression of political support. However, to not grant the umbrella of privacy to political contributions only because a portion of the contributions is made for other reasons would be impermissible. The Constitution does not turn a blind eye merely because of the possibilities of misuse. Thus, the right of informational privacy extends to financial contributions to political parties, which is a facet of political affiliation. We have applied the double proportionality standard to balance the conflicting rights of the right to information and the right to informational privacy. The Constitution does not establish a hierarchy between the right to information guaranteed under Article 19.1a and the right to informational privacy to political affiliation traceable to Articles 19.1a, 19.1b, 19.1c and Article 21. The Union of India submitted that Clause 7.4 of the Electoral Bond Scheme balances the right to information of the voter and the right to informational privacy. We are of the opinion that Clause 7.4 of the Electoral Bond Scheme does not adequately balance the rights, but rather tilts the balance in favour of the right to informational privacy because a. The suitability prong of the proportionality standard is only partly fulfilled. The non-disclosure of information grants anonymity to the contributor, thereby protecting informational privacy. However, there is no nexus between the balancing measure adopted with the purpose of disclosure of information to the voter. According to Clause 7.4 of the Electoral Bond Scheme and the amendments, the information about contributions made through the Electoral Bond Scheme is exempted from the disclosure requirements. This information is never disclosed to the voter. The purpose of securing information about political fund funding cannot be fulfilled by absolute non-disclosure. B. We have proceeded to apply the subsequent prongs of the double proportionality standard, assuming that the suitability prong is satisfied. Section 29, capital C of the Representation of People Act, which states that information of contributions made below rupees 20,000 in a financial year need not be disclosed is a lesser restrictive means to achieve both the right to information and the right to informational privacy. The underlying rationale on Section 29C1 is that contributions below the threshold do not have the ability to influence decisions and the right to information of financial contributions does not extend to contributions which do not have the ability to influence decisions. Similarly, the right to privacy of political affiliation does not extend to contributions may be made which may be made to influence policies. It only extends to contributions made as a genuine form of political support. It is quite possible that contributions beyond the threshold of rupees 20,000 could also be a form of political support and not necessarily a quid pro quo arrangement, and contributions below the threshold could influence electoral outcomes. However, the restriction on the right to information and informational privacy of such contributions is minimal when compared to the provision of blanket non disclosure. Thus, this lesser restrictive alternative realizes the right to information of an informed voter and informational privacy to political affiliation in a real and substantial manner. The Union of India has been unable to establish that the measure employed in Clause 7.4 of the Electoral Bond Scheme is the least restrictive means to balance the rights of informational privacy to political contributions and the right to information of political contributions. Thus, the amendment to Section 13, capital A, bracket B of the Income Tax Act introduced by the Finance Act 2017 and the amendment to Section 29C1 of the Representation of People's Act are declared unconstitutional. The question is whether this court should only strike down the non-disclosure provision in the electoral bond scheme, that is Clause 7.4. The anonymity of the contributor is intrinsic to the electoral bond scheme. The electoral bond scheme is not distinguishable from other modes of contributions through banking channels such as checks, transfer, transfer through the electronic clearing system, or direct debit if the anonymity component of the stream is struck down. Thus, the Electoral Bond Scheme 2018 will have to be struck down as unconstitutional. Issue 4. Whether the amendment to Section 182.3 of the Companies Act is unconstitutional. 
the amendment to section 182 bracket 3 of the Companies Act, deleting the requirement of disclosing the particulars of contributions made to political parties is unconstitutional for the following reasons. A. Section 182.3, as amended by the Finance Act 2017, mandates the disclosure of total contributions made by political parties. This requirement would ensure that the money which is contributed to political parties is accounted for. However, the deletion of the mandate of disclosing the particulars of contributions violates the right to information of the voter since they would not possess information about the political party to which the contribution was made, which, as we have held above, is necessary to identify corruption and quid pro quo transactions in governance, information which is necessary for exercising an informed vote. B. Section 182.3 of the Companies Act and Section 29C of the Representation of People Act, as amended by the Finance Act, must be read together. Section 29C exempts political parties from disclosing information of contributions received through electoral bonds. However, Section 182.3 not only applies to contributions made through electoral bonds, but through all modes of transfers. In terms of the provisions of the Representation of People Act, if a company make, made contributions to political parties through check or electronic clearing system, the political party has to disclose the details in its report. Thus, the information about contributions by the company would be in the public domain. The only purpose of amending Section 182.3 was to bring the provision in tune with the amendment under the Representation of the People's Act exempting the contributions through electoral bonds from disclosure requirements. The amendment to section 180 to 3 of the Companies Act becomes osseous in terms of our holding that the electoral bond scheme and relevant amendments to the representation of the People Act and the Income Tax Act mandating non-disclosure of particulars on political contributions through electoral bonds is unconstitutional. Whether unlimited political contributions by companies is unconstitutional. The amendment to Section 182 of the Companies Act permitting unlimited political contributions to companies, or it should be by companies, is manifestly arbitrary for the following reasons. A. The ability of a company to influence the electoral process through political contributions is much higher when compared to that of an individual. A company has a much graver influence on the political process, both in terms of the quantum of money contributed to political parties and the purpose of making such contributions. Contributions made by individuals have a degree of support or affiliation to a political association. However, contributions made by companies are purely business transactions made with the intent of securing benefits in return. The amendment to Section 182 is manifestly arbitrary for treating political contributions by companies and individuals alike. B. Companies before the amendment to Section 182 could only contribute a certain percentage of the net aggregate profits. The provision classified between loss-making companies and profit-making companies for the, for the purpose of political contributions and for good reason. The underlying principle of this distinction was that it is more plausible that loss-making companies will contribute to political parties with a quid pro quo and not for the purpose of income tax benefits. The provision, as amended by the Finance Act 2017, does not recognize that the harm of contributions by loss-making companies in the form of quid pro quo is much higher. Thus, the amendment to Section 8182 is manifestly arbitrary for not making a distinction between profit-making and loss-making companies for the purposes of political contributions. C. The purpose of Section 182 is to curb corruption and electoral financing. For instance, the purpose of banning a government company from contributing is to prevent such companies from entering the political fray by making contributions to political parties. The amendment to Section 182 by permitting unlimited corporate contributions authorizes unrestrained influence of companies in the electoral process. This is violative of the principle of free and fair elections and political equality captured in the value of one person, one vote. The following are our conclusions. A. The electoral bond scheme, the proviso to Section 29C bracket 1 of the Representation of the People Act 1951, as amended by Section 137 of the Finance Act 2017, Section 182.3 of the Companies Act, as amended by Section 154 of the Finance Act 2017, and Section 13, <coughs> capital A bracket B, 
as amended by section 11 of the Finance Act 2017 are violative of Article 191A and unconstitutional. And B, the deletion of the proviso to section 182.1 of the Companies Act permitting unlimited corporate contributions to political parties is arbitrary and violative of Article 14. We consequently issue the following directions. A, the issuing bank shall herewith stop the issuance of electoral bonds. B, State Bank of India shall submit details of the electoral bonds purchased since the interim order of this court dated 12 April 2019 till date to the Election Commission of India. The details shall include the date of purchase of each electoral bond, the name of the purchaser of the bond, and the denomination of the electoral bond purchased. C. State Bank of India shall submit the details of political parties which have received contributions through electoral bonds since the interim order of this court dated 12 April 2019 till date to the Election Commission of India. SBI must disclose details of each electoral bond encashed by political parties, which shall include the date of encashment and the denomination of the electoral bond. D. SBI shall submit the above information to the ECI within three weeks from the date of this judgment, that is by 6 March 2024. E. The ECI shall publish the information shared by the SBI on its official website within one week of the receipt of the information that is by 13 March 2024 and F electoral bonds which are within the validity period of 15 days that which have uh, but which have not been encashed by political parties yet shall be returned by the political party to the purchaser depending on who is in possession of the bond to the issuing bank the issuing bank upon the return of the valid bond shall refund the amount to the purchaser's account I have respectfully agreed with the judgment order by Dr. Justice. Which I should. Uh, I have also applied the proportionality standards, but with slightly different variation. My conclusions are the same. Uh, it's written in a way that the comp subject is complex and judicial review is always legalistic, but I've tried to simplify it. Grateful to the court. Sir. Grateful to the court. Very salutary judgment for Lord, which will have a very significant impact on our quality, on our yeah, we, 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 we appreciate uh, that. That is outside now. Outside, Lord. No, no, no. Press. no, no, no. The I, photographers I, I, are outside. So you are saying this at wrong place. Deeply obliged, Lord. Sir,